My name is the Reverend Oscar Sinclair, and it's a pleasure to serve this, the Unitarian Church of Lincoln, um, here in Lincoln, Nebraska, on this, this lovely, timely fall day. It is a pleasure to welcome you here and to be a part of this tradition. Every Sunday morning in this church, we talk about the vision of this congregation, that we are a loving community uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and transform the world. And we say every morning that, that we unite reason with spiritual exploration, that you need both of those things to be a religious community. You need to do deep spiritual work, and we also want to learn. Because it is when you combine those two things that you transform the world. And that's what this lecture series is about. So I'm not gonna spend much time talking. I did that this morning. <laughs> But instead, I'll hand off to Joe Brown, who will say a little bit about the history of this lecture series and what we're going to be doing tonight. So again, welcome, and here is Joe. to our 2019 lecture. Um, the Sorensen Committee is an absolutely wonderful group of folks who have worked together to bring this evening's lecture to you. Will those on the committee please rise and let's give them all a big hand for all the work they've done. Jean Helms, who has helped us in many, many ways to put all the puzzles of this together for this evening. This evening presentation will be broken into three parts. The evening begins with a lecture by Don Wilhite, assisted by Clint Rowe, and at about 8 o'clock, there will be a 15 minute break for a stretch, cookies, and lemonade, as well as an opportunity to use the bathrooms. Now, the bathrooms are located near the office on the north side of the entryway. You probably passed them as you entered the building and came down towards the sanctuary here. After this, I will emphasize, very brief break, please return to the sanctuary for a question and answer session. And Diana Schenick and uh, Jerry Petter will facilitate this session. Each will have live mics so you can be easily heard. The question and answer session will then end at 9 p.m. and we will all bid each other adieu. <laughs> so the see, see this little background on the Sorensen. You have a lot of information in the flyers you received, but this is kind of a little aside in addition to that. See, C.A. Sorensen was born in a lean-to on Bander County Farm. He rose to be Nebraska's Attorney General. He was a campaign manager and confident Senator George Norris through Norris's career. Some of C.A. Sorensen's many activities are listed in your program. The Sorensen family continued this record of public service. Robert was the voice of America. Thomas was Deputy Director of the U.S. Information Agency under Edward R. Murrow. Theodore was counsel and speechwriter with President Kennedy. Ruth was with the Peace Corps. Philip was Lieutenant Governor of Nebraska. And C.A. Sorensen, his wife Annis, and their five children all attended the Unitarian Church here in Lincoln. <coughs> and they were all very close family friends of my now longtime companion, Bob Gillen. Here's how the lectureship began. In November of 1996, Tom Sorensen had terminal cancer and returned to Lincoln to visit friends. Tom and Bob Gillen were dinner guests at the home of Charles and Pat Stevens. Charles was our former minister at that time. And during that gathering, Tom talked about a way to honor his father, C.A. Sorensen, through a lectureship, and the vision grew. After dialogues with the Unitarian Foundation and the church board, Tom agreed to pledge $35,000, and the Unitarian Church was to raise an additional 15000 
which would bring the total to 50,000. Um, Bob Gillen, Earl Dyer, Francis Olmsted, and Charles Stevens joined together to raise the money and that created the funds that were the background of this Sorensen Lecture Series. The first speaker was Tom and Bob's good friend, William Lee Miller. The second was Ted Sorensen, followed by many others. The series continues to this very day. We have two speakers this evening. Both are long, well-known, and highly respected for their work in their fields. There's Don and Clint Rowe. Information about Don is included in your portfolio pamphlet. Unfortunately, through the mysteries of technology and those we all know, Clint's information was not included in your program. So I will welcome Christy, who is going to introduce both speakers and tell you a little bit about each. Thank you. Well, in the interest of allowing our speakers to have as much time as possible, I'm going to be very brief. I will tell you that um, if I told everything I know about them, I'd use up all of their time. So in your program, you do have uh, some biographical information about Don Wilhite, and I invite you to look at that. I want to just add a couple of things to that. Um, in 2014, Don co-authored with Clint Rowe uh, the UNL report, Understanding and Assessing Climate Change Implications for Nebraska. And in two, 2015, a year later, he organized eight sector-based stakeholder roundtables at UNL to identify adaptation and mitigation strategies for each of these sectors as a first step towards the development of a climate action plan for Nebraska. And they are on a website and he will share that with you later. Um, missing from the program is the information about Clint Rowe. He's the professor and department chair currently of the Earth and Atmospheric Sciences Department at UNL. His area of concentration is physical meteorology and climatology with expertise in climate modeling, climate change, and variability. And his study of land surface and atmosphere interactions have ranged from studies of the Greenland ice sheet to his current projects in the Nebraska sand hills. Another to me very fascinating undertaking he uh, is doing right now is modeling the climate of Pangaea of 200 million years ago during the Jurassic era. And <laughs> I don't know how he does that, but um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> More recently, Clint has been involved in projects to supply high resolution projections of possible future climate for use by policymakers in countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. And he's the author or co-author of numerous publications, including that aforementioned Nebraska study that he did with Don. And so the title of the talk tonight is a little bit different from what the program says. It's the challenge of achieving climate justice in a changing climate, the intersectionality of climate change. I think it says that up there. And then they, he and Clint will engage in dialogue before the break and the Q&A. So be sure you come back because that's going to be an exciting question and answer period. Thank you, and I want to welcome Don Wilhite, who will begin the program tonight. Lights. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome to all of you. I'm pleased everybody came. It looks like we filled almost every seat, so that's great. Uh, this is a really challenging time, I think, as we try to deal with this issue of climate change. And so, while I give a lot of talks just about climate change, this one's a bit different because I'm trying to link climate change to a number of other global issues. And uh, so that's a bit more of a challenge, uh, but it also is something very important to see how climate change is gonna affect so many aspects of society everywhere in the world. So that's very important. The title, um, I will say, is an awfully long title. That's because I was trying to incorporate what I consider to be key words 
And those are the key words. So what I want to do tonight is kind of link climate change to what is referred to as climate justice and look at the intersectionality, and I'll define those terms for you as we go along, the intersectionality of climate change with so many other global issues uh, around the world. Well, for some reason, this is not working. Okay, I may have to use my laptop. So, um, I show this slide. Uh, this is the, the, the latest book that I've done. It's co-authored with uh, uh, chief climate scientist at, at NOAA, Roger Polwarty. What was that? Somebody's cell phone? Uh oh. <laughs> we should have had that. Okay, so it's all. Okay, um, so most of my career, um, I worked on the drought issue, looking at drought management issues, uh, institutional issues associated with drought management, drought policy, drought impacts, drought monitoring, and I've done this uh, all over the world. Uh, in 1995, I formed the National Drought Mitigation Center, which is located here in Lincoln at the University, and we've been doing global work uh, ever since uh, that was formed and even prior to that, uh, that occurring. And as I was thinking about this lecture, it's the linkage between drought and climate change, which I think is important maybe to point out as well. Drought is considered to be a slow onset phenomenon. Uh, climate change is also somewhat of a slow onset, gradual creeping <coughs> phenomena, incremental changes. The difference here, of course, is with droughts, droughts come and go. Climate change, on the other hand, is something that is changing and is changing more rapidly. Uh, year by year as we move forward. And we'll talk about some of the basics there in a little while. Uh, also, it's important because climate change is really exacerbating drought issues around the world. So droughts are becoming more frequent, they're becoming more severe, um, and of longer duration as a result of climate change. And this is going to, going to continue because climate change is associated with more extreme events and these extreme events are very costly for all of us and for the world, world as a whole. Let's see if I can get this to work. This time. No, okay. Um, also, the interesting thing about both climate change but also droughts, um, we're getting a technological solution here. <laughs> That means I can move farther. I like to roam around, so anyway. Uh, so whether you're talking about natural hazards or you're talking about climate change, you have to ask the question, who are the most vulnerable? Well, the people that are the most vulnerable are the people that are the resource poor and so on. And so they have difficulty preparing for droughts or climate change, coping with them, uh, and also recovering from them. And so, both climate change and drought have some, have some remarkable similarities. So all of the work that I've done over my career on drought, a lot of that trans transfers very nicely into studies related to climate change. Okay, now this one's not working. <laughs> Finally. Okay. So again, who are the most vulnerable? So whether we're talking about climate change, or we're talking about natural hazards, of which drought is one, uh, those... I think it's pointed toward the computer. Okay, that's not the way mine's supposed to work. <laughs> okay, so again, as I said, the resource poor, um, and this would be in both developing countries as well as in developed countries. Obviously, there are a higher percentage of resource poor in, in, in developing countries. The poverty stricken in both developing and developed countries. And also, particularly with regards to climate change, we hear a lot about sea level rise. So coastal communities, island nations, some of those island nations are gonna be overwhelmed by, by sea level rise as we, uh, as we move forward. Perversely, as this says, the people that are the most resource poor, whether in developing countries or in developed countries, 
are actually contributing the least to the climate change issue in terms of emissions. But yet they're the ones that are going to be bearing the, the greatest impacts associated with these. And so that's, um, that's a disconnect, I think, that, that we need to take into consideration. And so it also raises the question about you know, why should the developed countries of the world assist developing countries in adapting to and preparing for climate change? Well, it's because the developed countries have for the most part created this problem. And so we have a responsibility, I think a moral responsibility to help other countries adapt to this situation and also prepare for the situation as we move, as we move forward. So here's a slide that shows the trend of natural hazards or natural catastrophes from 1980 through 2018. Notice the rather remarkable increase in the frequency, the number of these catastrophes that are occurring all over the world uh, and with increasing frequency since 1980. This, this uh, graph breaks these natural catastrophes into a number of categories. One would be geophysical events, so tsunamis, <laughs> volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, and so on. And you'll notice the, the red bars at the bottom are relatively constant. But notice what's happening with regards to natural hazards that are associated with the atmosphere. So meteorological, climatological, and hydrological disasters and how these are increasing. So increasing frequency translates into increased economic, social, and environmental costs for all of us. So to look at this a little bit different way and, and put it in a bit of a different uh, perspective, uh, the World Economic Forum every year does a, a global risk report. And so in this global risk report, they identify the top risk facing global society. Um, and so in 2008, you can read what, what they considered to be the top global risk affecting the world. If you compare that with 2019, you can see that all, all but one of those global risks are associated with the atmosphere hydrologic system. So again, it relates back to climate change and what climate change is driving in terms of more natural disasters, more extreme events, concern about the failure of climate ad adaptation and mitigation efforts, uh, biodiversity, ecosystem collapse, and these kinds of things. So th these things are all being tied to what's happening with our climate system. So it's quite a shift from 2008 to uh, 2019. So, to set the stage for my presentation, uh, now that I've gone through some background information, first we're going to go through a few definitions to try to bring us all on the same plane. Uh, secondly, we're going to talk about the essential threat of climate change, uh, looking a bit at the science, the implications and the projections associated with that. I'm not going to delve into climate change because we don't have time to get other aspects of climate change that I want to touch on uh, in this particular lecture. But they do need to go through some of the basics. So I think we want to get into questions more about climate change um, and those forcing functions and all of that sort of stuff, greenhouse gases. I'll talk about that a little bit, but we can do that maybe during the uh, Q&A. Um, Next is this issue of intersectionality, climate change and climate justice. So how climate change disrupts achieving the sustainable development goals. And if you don't know what the sustainable development goals are, I'm gonna tell you in a few minutes. And so we're gonna, we're gonna go through a process where we talk about, about these and uh, spell those out for you. And then finally, some takeaway points, challenges, and opportunities moving forward. Okay, so first of all, definitions. Let me wet, wet my whistle. 
So first of all, a definition of climate change. We all know that climates have changed on Earth over geologic time scales. So we've had ice ages, we've had warm periods, and so on. So climate change can be defined as a long-term change in the Earth's climate. So it could be in, in, increasing temperatures or it could be decreasing temperatures, depending upon when you're going into or out of an ice age or whatever. Um, at the moment, what we're mainly concerned about, of course, is increasing atmospheric temperatures. And so we're looking at trends. In either case, we're looking at trends, temperature trends related to a changing, a changing climate. But I think you have, when you think about climate change, you need to go beyond temperature because temp temperature changes are driving other aspects of the climate system, other changes in the climate system. So we're talking about changes in the frequency and the amount of precipitation, the distribution of precipitation. We're talking about changes in extreme events, heat waves, and so on. So I would much rather prefer using the term climate change than global warming, because with global warming, the implication is we're mainly concerned about temperature changes. And we're really looking at not just temperature changes, but all of those other changes in the atmospheric system or the climate system that are affecting all of us, precipitation uh, and so on. Sustainable development, another term, and this relates to what we'll talk about in a few minutes about sustainable development goals. So sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. This is the definition that's been around for a long time, uh, formulated through what was called the Brundtland Commission, and so it's still a very applicable definition of sustainable development today. So in looking at this, you can look at particularly the part that I've underlined, and you can ask the question, well, is climate change also compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So that's a, that's a key part of this definition, particularly today, whereas when this definition was formulated maybe 30 years ago, that maybe wasn't one of the considerations. They were thinking mainly about development that is compromising the needs of future generations. Now we're talking not just about development, we're also talking about things like climate change. Okay, so the other term, climate justice. This is a term that's a relatively new term. It's linked, of course, to social and environmental justice. So it's an aspect of that. But now with climate change, climate justice is a term that we're hearing more and more frequently. And we'll get into more detail about that as we go along. So with climate justice, we're talking about the impacts of climate change are already being felt by millions of people around the world, including those of us here in Nebraska. And especially affecting, again, the most vulnerable are these marginalized communities, individuals, and so on. The climate crisis is intertwined with many other crises. So we hear a lot about things like uh, food security, water security, moving forward. Um, and also biodiversity, biodiversity loss, and a lot of other aspects of sort of global issues. And we'll get into those in, in more detail in a few minutes. And then addressing climate change to achieve social, environmental, and climate justice is going to require a restructuring of societies. In other words, if we're going to deal with this issue of climate justice and climate change, we're going to have to start doing things differently. And we need to start doing things differently now. We can't wait 10, 20, 30 years because the rate of change and the number of people that are affected by this uh, is going to be really, really dramatic. So what we're really talking about is a change in paradigm. We need to think about solutions to this problem very differently than how we've gone about with our development uh, up to this time. So let's talk a bit about this threat of climate change that we're already facing and it's going to become more prominent as we move forward. So a few key, uh, a key points about climate change, and again, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about, about this because I want to move into other topics, 
the global temperatures are rising at unprecedented rates. There have been tremendous changes in temperature in, on geologic time scales, but these again have occurred over thousands of years where we've gone into uh, an ice age or come out of an ice age, ice age or a warm period. We're talking here about unprecedented rates over periods of decades. So it's a very different problem than what we've had in the past. Greenhouse gases are the heat regulators for the atmosphere. So as you increase the concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere, you increase the, the, the temperature of the Earth as a result of that. And we'll get into that in more detail. <laughs> CO2 concentrations are currently about 415 parts per million. At the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, they were at 280 parts per million. They're increasing by about two and a half parts per million per year. So it won't be long before we hit 450, 500, 550. And if you think about that in terms of geologic time scales and what we've experienced in the past, this is not anything that we've experienced over millions of years. And certainly not over periods where humans have been around, particularly the number of humans that we have now. So, um, so human activity is the main cause for this tremendous increase in temperature that we're experiencing now. Uh, there are natural forces that have controlled the climate of the Earth over uh, centuries and over thousands of years and so on. But human activity is what's mostly driving the changes that we're seeing now. And so we can get into discussion about that, but there's really no other plausible explanation for what we're, we're seeing. I hear people say, well, it's because we're getting more energy from the sun. The data doesn't bear that out. So, I mean, people will come up with all kinds of different explanations for why the temperature is increasing, but it's human activity. Burning of fossil fuels, land use changes, principally. So as global temperature rises, we're seeing more and more of these extreme events, and these extreme events are very costly. So economically, socially, environmentally, these uh, extreme events are raising havoc on, havoc on economies around the world. In fact, a, a recent report that came out of um, the um, uh, out of the San Francisco office of, by an by a, uh, investment analyst said that climate change could very well be the cause for the next financial crisis. So this is a serious, serious problem. So without action, this is just going to get worse. So if we don't do anything about this, and the rate of change of temperature is escalating and so on, so we really need to take action, and we'll talk about that more in a few minutes. But action must include both adaptation, so we have to adapt to the changes that we're already seeing, and certainly the farmers in Nebraska are doing that. There are longer growing seasons, changes in precip uh, precipitation patterns and distribution and, and so on. So farmers are already adapting to these changes that we're seeing in the state and in other regions of the world as well. So we have to adapt to the changes that we're seeing, but we also have to mitigate. Mitigate means that we're going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and that's going to bring down the projected warming rates for uh, the world as a whole. So we have to do both adaptation and mitigation if we're going to address this issue successfully. So here's a graph that shows global temperatures, and I know global mean temperature doesn't mean a lot to you because it's not your local area, but it gives us an idea of the trends. So if you look at this, you can see since 1880 how the global mean temperature has increased. And I put the black line in there to show the change in the trend where we have a much steeper uh, rise in temperature since since 1970 or so. So this is continuing to, uh, to escalate. So here's another graph that shows essentially the same thing with global temperatures, but overlaying global temperatures you have CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. And so these things tend to parallel one another. And this is true on geologic time scales as well. So now I want to show you an animation, because it's one thing to look at a graph, 
and see how temperature has been changing. What this map will show spatially is the change from year to year, and by looking at those changes year to year, you get an idea of the trend. So what you have here is for the year 1880, the areas in the darker red and brown are areas in 1880 that were above the long-term average in 1880. The areas in blue were below the long-term average, okay? So when I animate this, it's going to run through the years from 1880 to 2016, and you're going to get a feel for the types of changes that have been occurring and the magnitude of these changes. So each one of these maps represents an individual year. You can see that you could have seen the Dust Bowl, except it's moving so quickly. But just look at what's happened <coughs> since 1980. So we're just being dominated by these above average temperatures and essentially everywhere on the globe. But it's not the same everywhere on the globe. So um, this sort of dramatic change is really I don't want to do that again. Okay, so this graph, and this is one that we might come back to during the discussion period. Uh, this is a graph taken from the, uh, the recent National Climate Assessment Report. Um, and so what you have here is you have temperature change on the left, and you have years across here, out to the end of this century. And so this is the observed global temperature here up to the red line, which is current, okay? So the question is, projecting climate change into the future, what can we expect? Well, the climate models, which, and, and Clint is a, is a climate modeler, uh, the climate not models do a good job of replicating historical climate. So we have, we have some faith that these climate models are gonna be useful in projecting future climate. But the thing we don't know about the future climate, since CO2 is such an important component of these projections, we don't know what the CO2, CO2 content uh, or concentration is going to be in the atmosphere in 2100. So what the climate modelers do is they look at various scenarios of CO2 in the atmosphere as we move forward. And there are a lot of different scenarios that are run, but here you have three. So the brown line is representing business as usual. So if we keep doing what we're doing, burning fossil fuels like crazy and, and increasing the CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere, um, we're going to be looking at somewhere by the end of the century, we're gonna be looking at somewhere around eight plus, an eight plus degree increase Fahrenheit in terms of temperature. Global, temp global mean temperature. This mid-level um, scenario here, if we're able to reduce the concentration or the emissions of CO2 into the atmosphere, we can slow down, reduce the amount of warming, and by the end of the century, we might be looking at somewhere around four or five degrees Fahrenheit. And then this rather unrealistic one would be a lower emission scenario or we really flattened out very quickly. And so the, the amount of temperature that would, would increase would be uh, significantly less compared to the business as usual. So as we look to the future, we don't know what society is going to do about reducing CO2 emissions by burn, you know, through the burning of fossil fuels. So we can look at different scenarios and see where the temperature might lead us. So this is the middle, middle emission scenario. Um, this is a map produced by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And this is looking at, again at the middle emission scenario for the globe in the period 2080 through 2100. If you think about it, that's not that far out. Um, just think about 50 years ago for each of you. Um, and so on, and how quickly those 50 years have gone by. So most areas, most land areas, 
We're looking at increases somewhere between, say, five and nine degrees Fahrenheit if we continue on this current path. So again, this is the middle emission scenario, not the high emission scenario. So in 2015, leaders from all over the world, scientists from all over the world came together in Paris, and almost all nations of the world signed the Paris Climate Treaty. And the purpose of the climate, Paris Climate Treaty was for each of the countries to make commitments to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions so that the amount of warming that we ha would have and globally would be leveled out at about two degrees centigrade. That was the goal. Uh, so all countries came to the Paris, Paris Climate <coughs> Treaty with their own proposals of how they intended to do that. But these proposals, these commitments are not binding. And so that's, that's a problem. Uh, but it's just, it was an important first step and getting the global community together to really focus on, focus on this issue. Then last fall, uh, there was a report that came out from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that said, well, wait a minute, two degrees is going to cause just major impacts. We really need to stay below 1.5. And the difference in impacts and the risk associated with going from 1.5 to 2 were going to be tremendous. So in order to stay below um, 1.5 C, they said we we're going to have to reduce CO2 emissions to 45% of the emissions in 2010, and we have to do this by 2030. So at the time, that gives us <coughs> essentially 12 years to do something. That was in 2000, October of 2018. We're already in October of 2019, so now we're down to 11 years. So this really shook up a lot of people, but unfortunately it didn't shake up enough policymakers or governmental leaders uh, to really move into more, uh, more action. And then, even more dramatically, Following that report from last, uh, last October, we got into a series of other reports that were released, one in May of this year, that focused on biodiversity and ecosystem services, that said within the near future we're gonna lose one million species of plants and animals. <coughs> Not entirely because of climate change, but it's a factor in that. And then there was a report that came out in August, which was on climate change in land, and was focusing on land degradation, food insecurity, uh, soil health, water scarcity, and so on. So once again, it, some very dire predictions, focusing on land and what climate change was going to do on land. And then about 10 days ago, a report came out on oceans and cryosphere that talked about what was going to be happening with not only mountain environments and oceans, but also sea level rise in polar regions and so on. So once again, very dire predictions as to what's gonna happen if we don't get a handle on this climate change issue. So let's talk about intersectionality and uh, climate change and climate, climate justice. So the term intersectionality began, really came out of uh, more of the social science literature that was focusing on things such as uh, race, class, and gender. But today, the term intersectionality is really being applied to the interconnectedness of so many different issues that are occurring around, around the world, so many global issues that we're very concerned about. Some of those were listed in the previous slide, and we'll talk about those more in a few minutes. Um, so these sustainable, sustainable development goals that I mentioned earlier, uh, these are goals that were agreed to by 193 world leaders, and the goal was to address a whole series of 17 different global issues and to make substantial progress on these by 2030. Again, that 2030 date just keeps popping up. So issues like poverty, hunger, uh, ocean land areas, trying to protect those, climate change, inequality, and so on. So all of these were sort of part of this, uh, these sustainable development goals. Um, 
So, I mean, if we could actually achieve, you know, these goals by 2030, I mean, that would be an outstanding achievement. But the question is whether we can do that and whether we can do that with this overlay of climate change and other factors. So, if you go on the, on the web and you Google sustainable development goals, you're going to come up with this wheel on the right hand side that has 17, 17 spokes in it. And those 17 are listed on the left hand side. So, no poverty, no hunger, addressing questions of inequality, clean water and sanitation, reduced inequality, sustainable cities. And number 13 on the list is climate action. So it is on the list. A re-expression of those sustainable development goals I put on this slide. So I'm not trying to show some as being more important than the other based upon the size of the font or some are bold and some are not. It's just a distinguishing one from the other. So you have here a listing of 16 of the sustainable development goals that were on the previous slide. And then the one that's missing is climate action. My argument is that unless we take action on climate change, it's really inconceivable that we can address these other issues. That's the issue. And so we need to be dealing with that so we can actually address these other sustainable development goals as we move forward. So, so climate change is in fact, you know, the elephant in the room. And so we really have to deal with that and we have to convince our policymakers so that people, our governor, our president, members of Congress, really buy into doing something about this, which currently they are not. And so it's, it's up to us to convince them, and one, one way to convince them is by voting. Um, so then the other elephant in the room is population growth. We're currently at 7.7 .7 billion people, and by the end of the century, we're gonna be at somewhere around 11 billion people. So, on top of the fact that you have all of these sustainable development goals that the world is trying to work on and achieve, you have climate change on top of this, and on top of that you have a rapidly expanding population. So there are two elephants in the room. And so we really, in addressing climate change, it's important that we do that. Addressing population growth is a very difficult topic culturally and, and so on. But it's something that we have to take into account. It's a very important, uh, very important issue. So, all right, there it goes. So I've, I've taken those 17 sustainable development goals and I've grouped them into what might, what I think of as being some of the common global issues that we all talk about and we hear about in the media. So human health, food security, poverty, deforestation and desertification, which is land degradation, uh, migration, water security, social justice, biodiversity, <laughs> national security, and so on. So this is a re-expression of those sustainable development goals into more topical areas. But once again, the white circle around here is showing, trying to show you the interconnectedness of every one of these and also their interconnectedness to climate change. So this is just another way of maybe looking at the sustainable development goals, but once again, the domination of climate change. So the thesis sort of the argument here is that climate change is leading to increased vulnerability for marginalized communities, for people all over the world. And so if you take issues or threats like migration, and we're hearing more and more about climate refugees now, not just environmental refugees or political refugees and so on, poverty, biodiversity, food security. Because of climate change, you're having a tremendous impact on the seriousness of trying to address that issue. For example, for poverty, the World Bank has estimated that by 2030, we're gonna have 100 million more people in poverty. 
um, two million more people suffering from food security by 21, uh, 2030. And so this filter of climate change is something that's really affecting, you know, magnifying the threat of these global issues as we try to address those. So just, just some examples on a couple of those circles that we saw in a previous graph. First of all, climate change has played a part in the, the war that we have in Syria. You have a series of, of uh, uh, years, of drought years in, in um, Syria that have forced people to move off of farms because they could no longer make a living, they had no crops, so they moved to the cities. So 1.5 million people moved to the cities. The cities could not handle those. And so you had all kinds of civil unrest which led to the Syrian war. Other cultural and political issues were going on as well. Um, drought in Central America is also um, having an impact on the number of people that are moving from Central America up through Mexico and wanting to come to the United States because the living conditions there, political conditions there are abhorrent. Um, it's going to, more and more, it's going to drive people from Africa to Europe and so you're going to have more and more climate refugees as the climate changes as we move uh, forward. And um, the number of climate refugees has already increased to about 24 million per year because of these extreme events that are occurring all over the world. People that are really in hardship in these marginalized communities, marginalized nations, and so on. Food security, we have huge issues with food security because increasing temperatures, increasing heat waves, uh, extreme events and so on is changing crop cropping patterns, what crops you can grow where, uh, crop loss and things like that. It's also uh, increasing the challenges associated with agricultural management. Trying to deal with that where you have more variability in the weather, more extremes and so on. Food shortages lead to higher food price, uh, prices, more food insecurity, and so on. And finally, some recent research is showing that climate change is reducing the protein content of staple crops, rice, corn, wheat, and so on. So this is going to increase pro protein deficiency in millions of people around the world as we move forward with climate change. Okay, to wrap this up, takeaway points and some conclusions. Um, in 2015, I asked Ronnie Green if he would invite Tony Lazarowitz from, uh, to the University of Nebraska to give a, a Herman lecture. And so he did that. So Tony came to campus and uh, we had some really good discussions with, with Tony. But one of the things, one of the slides that he showed, trying to simplify this issue of climate change uh, is to come up with the five truths about climate change in 10 words. So this is your proverbial elevator speech, okay? So, so what, what Tony came up with was it's real, it's us, it's bad, scientists agree, so there's broad consensus within the climate, or within the science community, and then finally there's hope. But in order to have hope, we have to have action. Because hope by itself, a lot of people have had hope to deal with this issue of climate change for a long time, but not much has happened. So we really need to have, have action. So if you, I'm sure everyone in here is aware of Greta Thunberg and what, what she's done, this 16 year old activist from Sweden, who actually this weekend was in Iowa City giving a talk to lots and lots of, of youth and other, other people. But Greta Thunberg talked about this in her uh, TED talk. If you haven't listened to her TED talk, you should. Um, where she talked about the fact that hope must be preceded by action. And so I can ask you all the question, what gives you hope? that we're going to be able to address this myriad of, of issues that, that I've been talking about for the last 
too long. Um, one of the things that gives me hope is the mobilization of youth. What started, what Greta started as a one person campaign on September 20th, we had 7 million youth that were striking around the world. We had about 500 that were striking here in Lincoln. And while the legislature is not paying much attention to them at the moment, they are going to continue to strike every Friday. We're gonna to go to the state capitol. So this has an impact. So intergenerational support for these youth is really important. So we don't have, I don't see any, what I would consider to be youth in the audience today. So your support, got two over here. So your, your support of your children and your grandchildren trying to promote action on this is just critically important. So we need to be supporting our youth. Uh, and so what we can do to help them, you know, to give them a voice in this issue is, is incredibly important. Um, so if we go back to these sustainable development goals that I mentioned earlier, I think trying to achieve these or our, our capability to achieve these by 2030 is probably unrealistic, particularly given the issues of climate change and just trying to mobilize the world to address these issues and having these issues and having the resources available to do that. Um, but climate action now can really uh, dramatically lower the risk associated with climate change because it's going to decrease the amount of warming and so on. So it's, it's going to change the risk factor uh, significantly and it's going to allow more progress on these sustainable development goals that I was talking about previously. So what can you do? For one thing, you can engage, engage in conversations with, with other people. Um, talk to them about the magnitude of the challenge that we're facing and the fact that we need action now. Certainly challenge leadership. And this is everything from the mayor to the city council to uh, county commissioners to the governor, members of the legislature. Because members of the legislature, by and large, do not even see climate change on the radar. And we've got to change that. And then most importantly, you need to vote. And so look at candidates and, and ask them questions about climate change. And how, what, what is their position on doing something about climate change? And you'll find that many of them, in many, many states, and certainly in Nebraska, will try to, to redirect and answer a different question altogether. I, I encourage you to, uh, to do this. Okay, there we go. So, what is your vision, vision for the future? So this rear view mirror is up there because are we going to just keep doing what we've been doing? Just increasing the, the burning of fossil fuels and this problem just gets worse and worse, or are we going to address it? Um, so I'll tell you a very quick, quick story. In the early 1990s, I was asked by Environment Canada and NOAA to organize a conference on the sustainability of the North American Great Plains. And one of the political leaders that was highly engaged in this topic was then Governor Ben Nelson. And so I asked Governor Nelson to come to the conference, which was held in Lincoln, and to give a talk, a keynote talk, about what he saw as important with regards to the sustainability of the North American Great Plains. And there was a quote that he used, and I don't know that it originated with him, but the quote was, if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always got. So what we're talking about here is changing the paradigm. He was talking about changing the paradigm for sustainability in the North American Great Plains. We're talking about changing the paradigm on climate action and moving forward. So I'm asking you to act now on climate justice and look for a different, a different future. 
a future where, where we are more sustainable, where we can address these issues for our children and our grandchildren as we, as we move forward. And finally, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll let you read this, this, this slide. You know, climate change is not a hoax, although our president calls it a hoax perpetrated by the Chinese. But anyway, um, yeah, I, I just thought this cartoon is just, you know, perfect. So I thought I would basically end up on that with the exception of, this is my final slide. Uh, these are the two reports that Christy was, uh, was referring to earlier. The one on the left is the report that, that Clint and I and two other faculty at the university did in uh, 2014 and looked at understanding and assessing climate change for Nebraska. Uh, I think this was a game-changing report for a lot of people, but unfortunately it hasn't fostered uh, action on the part of our legislature. Uh, and then a year later, I produced this report as a result of uh, organizing eight sector-based roundtables on things like energy, the faith community, uh, public health, water, agriculture, and, and, and so on. So both of these reports, as well as a lot of other information, is available at go.unl.edu slash climate change. So I encourage you to go download the reports, read through those reports. I think they'll be very education. They were not written for scientists, they were written for the public. So I think they're pretty easy to understand and I think Clint would agree with that. So with that I'm going to stop. I've used up almost all of the time before 8 o'clock. So, so the question is, let's, let's, I, I don't know. Okay, well, you covered pretty well. So, well, I, but, I, I'm gonna throw it so yeah, so the idea is Clint is going to ask questions, maybe of me, uh, maybe just raising some other issues, uh, and then we'll have a Q&A session after the break. So I'll, let me turn it over to you for now. Clint. Okay. Clint Rob. It's been a long time since I had to sit and take notes. But, but I, was, I was sitting there and taking some notes as Don was talking about things that I wanted uh, to bring up to add to some of the things that he, he mentioned. For, for example, so he showed the slide with the business as usual and the, a middle road and then a, I exactly what he called it, but the low level kind of rose colored glasses. Right? Yeah, you know, speak more to my This one? No, sorry. I can talk louder, <laughs> believe me. Uh, so until we, we get that set up, uh, I would be shouting at the mic when he turns it on. Uh, <laughs> I've never been accused of being quiet. Um, are we ready? Okay. So um, the, Don mentioned those three projections, and uh, the one that uh, was the, the, the top one we labeled as business as usual, right? Um, but I want to point out that that's not the worst case scenario. Yeah. It's just the worst case scenario that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change considered, right? And we could easily do worse than that. Give me a hand out. Okay, good. Is that better? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So that's not the worst case scenario. And the other thing about that is that we, we show these. And we don't always think about how long CO2 stays in the atmosphere once we put it there. There's a long-term commitment, even if we were to stop right now, which isn't gonna happen, if we were to stop putting any more CO2 into the atmosphere, we're committed to a long-term change. Maybe not quite as dire as some of those lines might show, but problems with that one and a half degree commitment is, is pretty close to becoming a reality, even if we stop right now. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out, and Don showed that animation, right? And then he then he followed up with another slide that showed that showed the um, uh, future projections, right? Carefully look at the scales of those things. The the animation he showed started out with oh, was looking at variations from uh, the 20th century mean, right? And it went from minus three degrees C to plus three degrees. 
And then he showed the projections for the future. And three degrees C was mm, a little bit to the left of the middle. You know, some of those temperatures are going out way farther than the, what we've seen over the 20th century. So it's really kind of scary. Yeah. So. Then I think there's a third elephant done. <laughs> Another elephant. Another elephant. <laughs> it's going to be a really crowded room. Um, I was really glad, and I mentioned this to Don earlier, that, he, that I was really glad to see that he was going to include a, a, a slide about population projections, um, because that really is a, a, an elephant in the room. But another thing is that, the third elephant is that in reality, those increase, the increase in population, those people are going to want a better standard of living. And if we don't change the paradigm, if we don't come up with a better way to provide that in, in, improved standard of living for those additional people without, or by a different model than what we've used to get to our standard of living, we're really, it's another, another threat multiplier if you want to think of it that way. So it's, it's just, an, 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 again, another, another big elephant. Anything else? Oh. Oh yeah, I know what else. <laughs> so, so you said that you had the ten words oh, about yeah. change that Tony Tony right. brought to us, and, and I've actually seen it now extended to twelve words. Yes, I have. The, the last two being act now, act now, act, act now, now, which is great. I think that's right. that's really good because you're right. Without any action, there is no work. That's right. So, so that's right. really really important. And the getting out and voting, you know, I think it's going to be incredible if we watch what happens. I think there's a huge potential since the last presidential election, there's a lot of 18 to 21 year olds that are coming online now, right? They're going to be, they weren't old enough to vote now in the last one, they will be old enough to vote now. And this is a high priority issue for them. And they're looking down, they're looking down the tunnel and seeing the train coming, right? Right. So I might add when, uh, about voting, uh, when I did the Airman Lecture, when we re released the 2014 report, uh, and the other authors of the report were sitting in the audience, and then after I was finished, Ronnie Green accepted questions from the floor, and the four authors of the report were sitting in front, and one of the questions was, you know, what can we do? And it was almost in unison that all four of us said, vote. Uh, you know, interrogate these people that are running for office and ask them about this issue. Because so many of them, either they don't understand or they haven't bothered to, to learn anything about it, or they'll just deflect the question and answer something entirely different, which that's what happens with politicians. They, they <laughs> yeah. um, so that's what they do is about the difference between adaptation and mitigation. Because it's really, it's not just the, the things that we have to do to adapt, or the things we have to do to mitigate, but where the costs for those actions come from, right? I mean, uh, cost for adaptation is distributed to everyone, and probably put more heavily on those people who can't really afford it, right? The, the, the underdeveloped countries and, and people in extreme poverty, for example. But mitigation costs really are going to fall on the countries that have the biggest contributions, and and so that's that's one of the things that is driving the politics is that the countries that have caused the problem don't want to pay for the problems they've caused. Right, exactly. Oh yeah, and then the, para the conference of parties, the COP21 that, oh. that uh, you talked about. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, those were non-binding agreements uh, and most of them haven't been met, right. even to, to so far, you know, so. Um, yeah, one country was withdrawing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, and then the last thing, the uh, last thing I wanted to mention too was that there are, uh, we talk about climate change, and people say, okay, we sometimes use global warming and climate change almost interchangeably, right? Um, because global warming is one of the big elements. But I, I'm glad that Don said that you know it's not the only one. So climate change is a broader thing. But we also did, we didn't mention you talked about the ocean report that was released. And one of the things you didn't talk about was ocean ocean acidification. Yeah. Because because 
while we've released a huge amount of CO2 into the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution, about half of it has actually gone into the ocean, and it, it creates increased levels of carbonic acid in the, in the ocean, which is a huge problem for um, organisms in the ocean that try to build calcium shells, which just doesn't work, like coral reefs, but uh, even some, some small microbes and things like that. So there's a lot of, a lot of impacts that, that go beyond the, the, the atmospheric part of the climate system that Don and I are most familiar with. Uh, I'm teaching a class this semester on the climate system, and we like to say that you know, the climate system includes not just the atmosphere, but the oceans, uh, the land surface, the cryosphere, uh, ice, and, ice and snow, um, and so forth. Right. You're done. I got it. That's all I got. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to give any more instructions or? Just take a short break. We're going to write them down. 14 minutes. Come back. 14 minutes. And you have a minute to get back in. tonight will be uploaded to the Unitarian Church website so that you can pick it up and look at it, uh, unitarianlincoln.org, and it will be available there. I don't know quite how soon, but it will be there shortly. One, uh, maybe before we take the first question, an issue that Skip raised uh, that I didn't bring up in my talk primarily because of time constraints, one of the big confusing parts of this whole issue of climate change is people get so confused <laughs> between weather and climate and you know weather is the condition of the atmosphere at a particular place in time and so it's as we know in Nebraska but anywhere it's, it rapidly changes hour to hour, so hour, hour to hour sometimes minute to minute and so on it's based upon wind speed and sunshine and all those kinds of things precipitation Climate is a statistical construct, and it's an average of weather over a long period of time. So when uh, Senator Imhoff from uh, Oklahoma goes into the Senate with a snowball to prove that global warming or climate change is a hoax, it's a hoax. <laughs> <laughs> did I say that? I think you did. So, so you know when people. There's a slide that I uh, show in some presentations. Uh, you, you went through a really unusual winter last winter, okay? And so most winters over recent decades have been very warm in Nebraska. Last winter was, was an exception to that. And so if you look at a map that shows temperature anomalies in, say, Jan or in February and March for the whole globe, you'll see that almost every place on the globe was way above normal in temperatures. And then over North America or Western North America, you have this area that was colder than normal. That was Nebraska. <coughs> but the rest of the world is heating up. Mm -hmm. And so people just have trouble putting this in perspective. Well, last winter was really bad, so therefore, you know, climate change is not real. That's ridiculous. You want to add to that? Yeah, yeah just that um, obviously, as Don said, weather is highly variable. So in the whole scheme of things, winter, winter being a couple of degrees warmer than normal or a couple of degrees colder than normal, doesn't mean you're not going to have cold days, right? You know, it doesn't mean you're going to have warm days. You're going to have a lot of variability within that. So, you know, the, we have to kind of get beyond that, that yes, we're going to have lots and lots of variability in the weather, probably even more variability in the weather as climate changes. Uh, but we're still going to have winter. <laughs> Right? And winter doesn't go away. It's going to be cold in the, the parts of the world that get cold. Uh, they're not going to warm up enough to not ever have a winter ever again. That's not what, how climate change works. <coughs> right. Right. Now, Penny had a question. I think it was the first. I, a lot of people ask me when I give a talk, okay, what's the 
lot of people ask me if I ever give a talk, which I do to various groups, okay, what's this horrible thing that's going to happen? Bill McKibben spoke a uh, weekend before last, a great climate activist and writer, etc. Not really a scientist, but a person who follows what's going on with climate. And he spoke of us as being in the rapids right now, heading towards the waterfall. But he didn't really want to name the waterfall. So I could take stabs at that, but I'd be interested in how both of you would name the waterfall or name the catastrophic reality. RCP 8.5 is one vision of what could happen, but it could be a lot worse. Are we talking about unmitigated rapid feedback, uh, feedbacks that continue? Are we talking about multiple extreme events at the same time that continue ex accelerating in their, in their in intensity as well as their occurrence? How do we begin to imagine to help people realize why we have to act now? Well, that, that was actually my answer. I know. Was, yeah. We don't know. But if we um, begin to talk about it, what can we imagine to help people get a hold of it? The re well, I was going to say, the reason we don't know is simply because in all of human experience, history, prehistory, we haven't experienced this. Right. You know, this is, this is really, you know, it's, it's like, you know, if you were to, 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 I don't know, go some, you know, be in a Lewis and Clark, you know, they didn't know what they were going to find, right? You know, um, there were droppers out here, but they weren't like breaking down everything they ran into. Um, we're going into uncharted territory. Um, what might happen? Lots of things. <laughs> and, and, you know, and I, well, like rapid uh, loss of biodiversity, <laughs> ocean acidification could really have a huge impact on the, the world's food supply. A lot of people uh, rely on oceans as the main source of protein in their diet. Huge things like that. So yeah, and just to uh, add to that, I, mean, I think the, the report that I showed from last October talked about the 1.5 degree temperature threshold and trying to stay below 1.5. I mean, that that did a lot of people like kind of square in the eyes in the sense that People ask the question, well, you know, is there a line in the sand and we don't want to cross that line? Well, they, they kind of put a line in the sand there and said this this is a threshold that we don't want to cross over. So that's a big concern. And the other thing that, that Clint alluded to are all these sort of feedback loops and these tipping points. I mean, we think we have a pretty good understanding of the climate system how the atmosphere interacts with oceans and lands and all of this interaction that takes place. But boy, we're still learning an awful lot of stuff. And at what point will, you know, the oceans are absorbing maybe half, around half or so of the CO2 we've been putting into the atmosphere. What happens if the oceans become saturated? Uh, so you reach a tipping point where the temperature, instead of going up like this, is going up like this. So there's just so many of those things that we don't, clearly understand because as Clint said, we haven't been here before. You know, so this is really something something new that we're trying to grapple with. Uh, oh where, 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 wherever the microphones go, that's where it's I've there. got the mic. Okay. I, I, <laughs> All right. Since I was right next to Penny. Um, you're saying that up to a million species, uh, plant and animal uh, could be lost. Uh, reduced resources, and yet you say that the human species population continues to increase. With reduced resources uh, in the future, uh, how do you account for uh, the, our own population continuing to increase? We're, we're pretty good at grabbing resources. <laughs> yeah, but, um, so, yeah, I mean, I think the issue there is, um, there, if you look at the number of people that are in poverty, a number of people that are marginalized in so many, so many ways, uh, because of lack of access to resources, that's just going to get worse and worse. And so there's a lot of talk about things like mass mass, mass extinction, and yeah, that's plants and animals, and we're an animal. So is there going to be a mass extin extinction of humans on this planet? And uh, when you think of Recurring droughts, more severe droughts, more hurricanes, you know, more heat waves. Um, that could really become a significant part of this. That, I mean, you have to look at the, the Earth 
What's the carrying capacity of the Earth? Is it 7.7 .7 billion? Is it 11 billion? What is the carrying capacity? And that's hard to know because more and more people are eating meat, so that changes that equation considerably versus eating grains and so on. So it's a tough question to grapple with, but. And we do, I mean, we have converted a lot of natural ecosystems to agricultural ecosystems, but there's still quite a lot of natural ecosystems out there right now that humans, if, the, if they were not gonna be con concerned about biodiversity and those factors, we could continue to expand agriculture into those areas. And then like John said, if we give, say give up the, the, the meat, you know, and, and stick with, go back to a more of a plant-based diet, we, we could increase the population. Uh, so the, the concern, you know, it's, it, it goes up, it's not unconstrained, but we have the ability to loosen those constraints quite a bit. We've done it for a thousand years. Is that the microphone next? Is it no. So the, yeah, it's on. Sorry. Does the paradigm that we should change have a name? The new paradigm? No. New paradigm. Oh. No, for a new for there to be a new paradigm, you have to have an old one. <laughs> They haven't done what I think it 
they need to do in terms of bringing together all the resources of the university to really focus on this issue. And when I say all the resources of the university, we're not going to solve the issue of climate change or we're not going to educate the public about climate change and we're not going to sort of force behavioral change or cause behavioral change without getting the physical scientists with the ecologists, with the social scientists, with the, with the fine arts community and so on. So all of these people work together to you know, attack this problem because it's, it's about behavioral change. So we need to involve the social science community. It's not just climate folks like us, it's all those other people that understand why people do what they do. And so that's what I mean by bringing the resources of the university together. So that's probably the best answer I can give. Yeah, can I, I add to that? Well, I don't have a lot to add to that. That's like, like Tom said, we're climate scientists. And when I talk about climate change and projections of climate change, I always run out those various IPCC scenarios, the various RCPs that uh, Don, Don showed. And um, you know, if we look at the, the variability within any given climate model, say, it's, it's not that big. It's, it's about the same variability we have in climate now. Um, if we look at the variability between the different climate models and different groups around the uh, world that, that, that use these climate models, we see that ah, that's a little bit bigger variability. There's a, you know, these, but first of all, they're all increasing. Uh, so they're all going in the same general direction. But the biggest uncertainty is what humans are going to do. Yeah. You know, and I, I, I can't get a handle on, on, on that. We really don't know what yeah. humanity, we've got to do something. It's got to be a concerted effort, you know? And when was the last time we had a concerted effort of all humanity on the planet? Yeah. <laughs> right. Got a microphone right here. When I talk with people about climate change and they express some skepticism, one of the things that they frequently say is, this is all built on projections, and they name a bunch of projections that have gone wrong, and say, so how can we trust these projections? Now, you're an expert on modeling. What can you tell us about modeling, uh, how it's done, and why and when we should trust it? Well, when, you, when, when people say that projections go wrong, right, they're looking at, they're looking at these things all wrong. Okay. Climate models aren't trying to predict what the weather is going to be like in any given year in the future. They're, you're not, you're not going to get a climate model to say what the weather is going to be like 20 years from now on your birthday. You know, it's just, that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to predict or project the changes in the climate system that will take place over time. What that means is that, and that's why there's a lot of variability between different climate models. Weather forecasting, okay, I'm gonna get real technical for just a minute, okay? Plant weather forecasting is what we call an initial value problem. We need to have a good idea of what the state of the atmosphere is right now, and then we're gonna run the models out as far as we can go, which is a couple weeks. And then they, you know, that's it. So weather forecasting does have this limit. It's a chaotic system. And we don't have good data now to start with, so we can't project into the future very far. Climate modeling is what we call a boundary value problem, okay? And the, the, what we really are concerned about is the energy coming in from the sun, which we have a pretty good handle on, and then what happens within the system. That's where things drop, drop off a little bit. There's a lot of feedbacks. Uh, we, can, we, can, we can make feedback, if you want an example. But, uh, you've all heard it before, right? There's a screaming microphone. That's a, a positive feedback where a small noise gets amplified over and over and over again. Uh, and it gets bigger and bigger. And there's some negative feedbacks where that damp the system back to where you want it to go. Boundary, this kind of, that kind of problem is actually, because it's constrained, it's actually much easier and we have a better handle on it. Again, the variability from year to year, day to day, season to season is gonna be there. We're not trying to figure out what that is. But all the climate models agree that global temperatures, global average temperatures will go up. They also agree that the, the uh, temperature increases are going to be greater in the Arctic, in the polar regions, than, than in the tropics. And, and, and that's based on, on physics and physical principles. And those are pretty well established. Okay, the, the details, eh, maybe not so much so, but the general trends. 
I, I get asked, like, okay, so climate modeling, does it work? Well, I'll tell you one thing we do pretty well, okay? What's the <coughs> biggest climate variability that we experience year in and year out? The seasons. Season. And climate models get the seasons pretty well. Why? Because it's based on the energy input from the sun. And we do pretty well. We can get that. If we couldn't get the seasons, I'd, I wouldn't be a climate modeler. <laughs> I would have given up long ago. But we can, and we do. And that's a huge variation. Now, again, the atmosphere and changes in the composition of the atmosphere change a lot of the feedbacks within the system. And that's where we have a lot of maybe some, some discrepancies among models. But in the, overall, the trend is there in every single model. Okay? If we had a climate model that showed it was, we're increasing CO2, and the temperatures were going down globally. <laughs> I question their physics first. <laughs> exactly. And one one point coming back to your question, um, and I wouldn't call this a projection, but back in the '70s there were some scientists, handful, maybe two handfuls, they were talking about global cooling, and um, that was not some something that was supported within the climate science community. It was, I don't know what you'd call it, a fringe group. It was a very small group that were talking about global cooling. So you have a number of people today that will say, well, they used to talk about global cooling, now they're talking about global warming. And so, you know, we can't believe what they're saying. What we're doing now in terms of projections is much, much different. And if you look at all the data that substantiates what's going on in the atmosphere, all the data that's being collected everywhere, oceans, land surfaces, and so on, it's just, there's no comparison to what we had back in the 70s, and people were speculating about global cooling. Another, another cool thing about models, um, and you could, I could inundate you with things all, all night here, but um, one cool thing about models is they're models, right? So you can leave this piece out. Yeah. You can put this piece in, right? And one, one interesting thing, and if, if you can browse through one of the IPC reports, almost, almost any of these reports seems to have this one thing in there, is they, you can run the model as if CO2 stayed the same throughout from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution throughout time. Right? And you can run the model with the known increase in CO2 in the atmosphere. And you can compare those runs. You can start back at 1850 and run the model forward. And if you leave CO2 at pre-industrial levels and you run the model forward, climate doesn't change. It just kind of goes along its merry way, kind of a flat line with a bunch of wiggles in it. If you put the CO2 increase, it goes up. Now, where are the observations? Are they going in a flat line? No, they stay with the climate models that incorporate CO2 increases. And I think that's one of the biggest ways that you can show somebody that climate modeling is not a fringe element, it's, it really is based in sound, sound physics. It's, it's sound science behind that. Yeah. We've addressed the uh, um, issues of uh, feeding a, a larger population as we move toward uh, 11 billion people, but you haven't mentioned water. How are we going to supply water for the, that increased population, along with the increased water that it will take to produce the crops, etc.? That is a, yeah, that is a huge issue. Uh, that's an issue that we tried to point out in the 2014 report because um, if you think about Nebraska agriculture and you think about the fact that we're going to see increasing temperatures in the summertime, therefore there's going to be more evaporation, more transpiration. Um, precipitation during the summer I think the models generally show that summertime precipitation is probably going to go down up maybe in the spring, but that means there's going to be less recharge. And besides that, the snowpack in the Rockies is, is declining. So there's going to be less runoff, less water in the Platte system, less water in the Missouri system, and so on. So how that's going to affect Nebraska agriculture and how, and of course, urban areas along the Platte River are taking a lot of water out of the river. So what's the sustainability of that? Lincoln is looking now at possibly going to the Missouri River. 
for the future and, and building a pipeline. Uh, so there's a lot of assumptions with those kinds of things. So where are you going to get the water? And going into some of these marginal areas that, that Clint was mentioning earlier, that maybe now could be adapted or changed into agriculture versus a natural system. The question is, is there enough water to actually produce crops in those areas? I mean, I think you're going to see vast changes in cropping patterns. I mean, we're already seeing that. If you look at the, um, the plant hardiness zones in the U.S. and how those have shifted over the last 20 years, I mean, it, it's shifted the equivalent of uh, probably two, 300 miles to the north. That's why if you look at South Dakota and how much corn they're growing now plus versus what they were growing 30, 40 years ago, it's dramatic change change from spring wheat to winter wheat in the northern plains areas and so on. So farmers are adapting to all of this, but a lot of it's going to be based upon whether there's water available. And people talk about the Corn Belt moving north into Canada, but Canada doesn't have the soils that we have. So Canada can't support the Corn Belt as we know it today. So that's another, uh, another so, issue. Yeah, I mean, the thing, the thing is, is the distribution of precipitation is going to be very different. And I think that's one of the things when we talk about uh, migration, climate migration is going to be huge. If, you, if people need to migrate to areas where there is sufficient water, it's going to exacerbate that problem. We've got another question right over here. Okay. You just bumped this a little bit on what's going on in the Arctic. But I'm sort of interested in what your models show and what impacts. Because there's some pretty crazy things taking in the Arctic, Greenland, Iceland, etc. We're going to buy Greenland, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll fix that. Yeah. yeah, there are there are a lot of crazy things. A lot. Of, this is one of the feedbacks in the system. Okay, so as the climate warms, this is why we get more warming in the polar areas, especially in the Arctic, is that we we melt more snow and ice. And snow and ice is highly reflective, which means that those areas now absorb more of the solar radiation than they do get in the summertime, and they warm up even more. So that's part of this polar amplification. In terms of some of the impacts, um, things if you don't have sea ice, if the sea ice edge migrates away from land, then it's not protecting the coastal environments that have been protected by that ice, and you get greater wave action, greater sh uh, uh, erosion of shorelines. It's really affecting some of the Arctic communities. Um, and then uh, animal life, if, if uh, uh, polar bears can't get out on the sea ice to look for seals, then they, they get it, uh, they can starve. Um, I, had, I had something else there. But I think I oh, um, permafrost melting could lead, lead to huge releases of methane, which is a potent greenhouse gas and uh, more potent per molecule on a per molecule basis than CO2 by far. Right, right. So that's a big one. In fact, in, uh, two, in 2015, um, I organized a workshop at the university with support from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, NOAA, and the University of Nebraska, where we looked at the dynamics of what's happening in the Arctic and how that was going to affect middle-latitude weather uh, patterns and climate patterns, how it was going to affect water management, agriculture. Um, and it's probably going to have, and it already is, I think, to some degree, having a dramatic impact. But the research is still pretty early pretty on on that. But this change in the gradient, temperature gradient, between the Arctic and the middle latitudes is changing very, very rapidly. And this is going to affect you know, tracks of storms and all kinds of things. So Joe Starrita had a question a while back, and I, somebody gave him a microphone. Oh, I'm, I'm, I think. Well, you're deferring? He's first. Okay, ladies first. Okay. Oh, sorry. I just want to say a few things, and I'm sorry if it's not what you guys are talking about. I read a book one time that talked about how, what would you do if your child had a fever, and it went up one degree, and then two, and then three, and you couldn't do anything about that. Wow. They had it for a week, they had it for a month, they had it for a year, and you could nobody could figure out what to do with that. How would you feel? What would you do? And that, to me, was the easiest way of looking at what's happening 
to our earth. Yeah. But anyway, and then I went to um, a speaker a few days ago at the lead. And she says, it's not about the numbers, it's not about the money. Don't let them tell you that. It's about the people. That's who we have to work with. And I went to a National Audubon Convention this year. It's remarkable what people are doing all over this country. Too bad we don't hear some of those stories yeah. in the news instead of all the garbage. And listen to a presidential leadership scholarship that had 30 plus people that graduated from their group and what they're all doing, the past graduates and what they're all doing all over the country. And when I think about what we can do, <laughs> I'm not very good at it because I should be riding my bicycle more or recycling better than I do. Or, you know, there's just so many things that we can do. And I think just having these talks is great. We're having more and more talks and at least getting it out, getting everybody together to talk about it and hopefully we could all take in someone. If there's so much poverty, even here in Lincoln, Nebraska, we could maybe take somebody in to live with us. Um, one thing I find very hopeful is a growing movement towards regenerative agriculture. And you guys touched on degradation of land quality and due to monoculture farming. I was curious if any of you or your colleagues have um, done any, ex any, any modeling on the potential for carbon sequestration here in the state um, from the way we're doing farming now as yeah. opposed to, and also have you made any modeling, back to Laurel's question, that has proven to be really wrong? You know, have you done some models that really fell off that some people might be pointing to, like she's saying, because I'm not familiar with it. None that I know of. Okay. I mean, every, every modeling group in the world has contributed to the IPCC assessments. Um, I've never seen a model. And, and the thing is, these models, you don't just run it once. You run it over and over again with slightly different starting conditions, slightly different, um, slightly different equations within them, um, what we call parameterizations. None of them turn around and go down. They, they, no matter what you do, they, they all have shown increases. Just to also respond to your question, um, I'm part of a group that's growing in numbers. Um, it's called the Nebraska Climate Elders, uh, the Nebraska Elders Climate Legacy Group. Um, are there any members of that group here tonight? Oh, Skip is here. So um, one, of the, one of the things we've been doing is trying to work on legislation. We've been working with state senators, um, uh, particularly uh, Patty Pansing Brooks, that we introduced with her legislation on a climate action plan. We can't get it out of the exec committee, uh, so it can even be, can be debated on the floor. But we were successful uh, with 2243 this last session, uh, which was a, a, a soil health bill. So it's really focusing try on creating, first of all, a soil health task force, which is already meeting, because the bill passed 43 to nothing. Uh, so there's a, a soil health task force that's meeting, and they're trying to bring the, bring the resources together to really promote more soil health within the state of Nebraska, which is all about increasing organic matter in the soil, holding more holding more moisture in the soil and also sequestering carbon. Uh, I will say we had to sort of approach that bill by not talking about soil health in connection with climate change, but soil health is just a good thing for farming because we thought that the state legislators, if you use the words climate change, that they're gonna say, well, you know, we don't believe in that. But we tried to stay away from talking about climate change and just talked about the value of climate health or soil health. Other questions? Joe Sparia. Okay. I, I, I'm just kind of curious. Everybody in here has swallowed the climate change uh, Kool-Aid. And I'm kind of curious, when you're out and about, when you're knocking up against the public, when you're talking to non-scientists, have you uncovered, discovered, encountered any kind of strategy or policy in dealing with climate deniers that you felt moved the needle and they actually could listen to you? or at least entertain the thought that they could be wrong? Have you, have you encountered any, any way of dealing with 
obviously it's uh, important to go out and vote, right. uh, but also uh, having conversations with people who don't believe it. Have you found effective ways to <coughs> deal with that in a way that uh, makes change for the good? Well, the group that I've talked to, occasionally you'll get some deniers. Usually they're pretty quiet because most of the people are absorbing the information and they already have a fair level of understanding about the issue. But occasionally someone will say something or ask a question. I had that happen to a, I think it was a Rotary Club group up in Omaha two or three years ago. My general, my general opinion is if you, if you look at the population, there's like 10 to 20% that you might put into the dire category. And we were talking, some of us were talking during the break. Um, some of them, no matter what you say, they just tune you out. I mean, they're, they're like a lost generation. I mean, so I think what we have to do is we have to focus on, and there are a lot of people, a lot of people in this room that understand that this is a problem and we want to address it. A lot of people who want to learn more about it, we need to educate, we need to build awareness. Because those people, we can move the needle on. I'm not sure we can move the needle on people that say that facts don't matter. I mean, it's just, they just are tuned out. Yeah, I don't know what's... No, I agree. I think that's, 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 that's the answer. Is the problem that I've run into is that, that as, a, as a climate scientist who's talked about climate change and, and climate change projections and models, I don't get invited by climate deniers to come talk to them. I'd love to, but I don't get the invitation. I guess I could go cry for, cry for a, a, a rotary uh, meeting or something like that and force them to listen to me, but that would be uh, probably counterproductive yeah. in a lot of ways. Yeah, I think a lot of them, they, don't, they really don't want, they don't want the information. They don't want to hear it. Because um, there's so much information out there um, that's readily available, and if they don't even bother to read it, I think they just tuned, tuned it out. So. That, that said, I, I'm open to invitations. So, I mean, if you you have neighbors, friends, whatever, and these kind of organizations that are probably not deniers, because but it, like Don says, they're, they're not going to listen to facts anyway. They're not going to let that persuade them. Um, but, but people who are wanting more information and not knowing where to go or who to talk to, I'm more than happy. I actually did get, I got an email um, out of the blue from some, some Kid, kid, uh, not all these. Some guy in Minnesota who said his, his mother is in Lincoln and really respects people at the university. Could she come talk to you about climate change? Because she doesn't know anything, you know. Uh, <laughs> and she won't listen to me because I'm her son. <laughs> Gentlemen, may I interrupt for just a minute? We don't have much time left, and I know of at least five people still who have questions. And so, Joe. As the chair of the group, how much time do we have? It says on the clock that it's nine o'clock. How many more questions can we take? How long do you stay? <laughs> I could stay till about five o'clock. I got a six o'clock flight. <laughs> yes. I'm not staying that long. <laughs> Pardon me? Ten more minutes. Ten more minutes. Ten more minutes. Okay. I think the gentleman up there, uh, I think his name is Skip, yeah. has, had his, has had his hand up for some time now. And I've got a couple back here. And I've had one of our committee members oh, you know, here. Now what you've done is generated about 15 or 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and the jury has an equal number over there. So. So, to infinity and back. <laughs> Skip. Don, you and I talked last week about the snicker-inducing term bovine flatulence. Oh, yeah. Oh. And I thought you might want to say a couple words about that and the mitigation thereof. Yeah. I mean, there, there is a, this is not, not one of my specialty areas. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, there's a lot of information out there about flatulence and cows and so on and how they contribute. I mean, agriculture contributes a lot to the greenhouse gas problem. It also has to be part of the solution. And one of the problems that agriculture has had for <coughs> several decades is when people started talking about agriculture and how agriculture needs to help control this problem, agriculture walked away from the table. And agriculture now is coming back to the table because they are part of the solution. But 
So there's the belief about you know whether or not you know that uh, flatulence on the part of uh, cows and so on are contributing. It's the belching of the cows and so on. So if you can breed a better cow, but I mean it, it is an issue and it's a, it contributes to the problem. Is it a real, it's really feeding them? Better feeding them. Better feeding them. Because that makes a difference. Feeding, feeding them some things. I mean, cows are not naturally meant to eat corn. Right. So a change in their diets can have a huge impact. So there's, there is a lot of research going on. You might be interested to know um, that the Natural Resources District in this area has been doing work in this area. Um, I'm on the NRD, and there have been several of those who are on the NRD board and who have been on the board. Uh, we have the recognition of changes in climate. We have the recognition that the, uh, the area that we have responsibility for includes looking at changes in climate. We've done such things as initiated a cover crop program so that we can have an increased sequestration uh, on the land. We, of course, try to keep water on the land. That's been our 50-year uh, goal, but it's even more important that you're gonna have more uh, and more, more frequent and more uh, significant uh, water pre precipitation. I just don't understand why the people of the city of Lincoln don't understand that we have a flood protection system here that was based on, on uh, precipitation and uh, 50 years ago, and our floodplain now probably is need, needs to have more look, and more review, and certainly our levees are at, at risk. Uh, I shouldn't say at risk, that sounds alarmist, but they need to be reviewed. Dead Man's Run and some of those things that we do. So there is local planning and there's local recognition of the need. Um, I just don't want to go on said that we're not doing anything. Right. And, and what you've said about the legislature, they're also looking at uh, the trees and the more, the more forestation and we have a tree program. And we'd like to, I'd like to see that greatly increased because the, the possibility of uh, more carbon sequestration with the use of carbon dioxide by trees is very important. So I don't want to say there's nothing that can be done. And also this, we get our water for the city of Lincoln from wells up at Ashland. The water that we get from Ashland, the recharge, generally comes from the loop system, not from water from the, from the um, <clears throat> uh, water runoff from the Rockies. So we have to be looking at working with other NRDs to make sure we have good water here in this area. Um, those are things that we just need a lot of education on. And from a planning perspective, uh, it's just really important for any organization that is looking at making planning decisions into the future, that they're not basing those planning decisions on the historical climate. They need to be looking at historical climate and these projections we've been talking about, because that's changing, it's changing the climate, but it's changing the, the frequency of extreme events. I mean, how many 100-year uh, rainfall events that we had in Lincoln in the last three or four years? These are 100-year events, and there have been, what, three of them? Uh, and it's just, uh, it's crazy. So planning storm sewers and all kinds of things for the city of Lincoln, you have to take this information into account and not use just, you know, historical climate Yeah, I just wanted to add to this, the older I get, uh, the more I'm aware of the fact that the conditions on Earth that have made it possible for me to live are so many and so com complex. I mean, I can look at the stars and the, I know that people have not found anywhere else in the universe so far as something certain about being like us on this earth. And it, I think it is very hard for people to realize, I think, all of the conditions that make life possible here. Right. And I wish that there was some easy way to do it. Obviously, to have something like the Pope or somebody who can really talk about 
the fact that we human beings have been given life in a, a very complex structure and we have the power to change it is probably what leads people to change uh, their attitudes rather than just some smaller part of it, which is, of course, important. Yeah, I love the, I love the poster that a lot of the youth carry and says there is no planet B. So when they say you're stealing our future. Thank you. Um, one thing that I have said, and I want to know if I'm making a liar out of myself. Uh, as I understand it, with the climate models, if you start them way back when, 100 years ago, and you run them, you can pretty well reproduce in general what's happened in our lifetime, is is that true? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. In general, as, long, as long as you include the increase in CO two, yeah. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. So it, only if you include the CO two increase, yeah, then you can replicate. So that gives you confidence in the models going forward. Right. I mean, why would it work going forward if you? Yeah. Right. If you, if you do a historical run from say the middle of the nineteenth century up to present, and it does pretty well in terms of the trend. Uh, that we've seen in the latter half of the 20th century until now, then you have confidence that the model has the correct physics on, in, under the hood and that it's going to keep on going and, and that its projection into the future is a, a good projection. You know, the, the other thing is that it seems to me that one of the main things we need to do, those of us that are concerned about climate, is to tell the truth. I think a lot of people get deflected and off on sidetracked by being real careful not to upset anybody or not to seem alarmist and so forth and so on. Um, but, and, and we get away from, the, from, from remembering that we need to tell the truth and let people deal with it as they will, um, which we have opinions about, but number one is tell the darn truth. But there's different ways to do that and different ways people can understand it and if I can check myself again, one of the ways I've started talking about it is to compare what things were like when I was a kid or when people who grew up in Nebraska were kids, they tell me what it was like and the amount of snow and so forth, and what our grandparents experienced during the Dust Bowl and looking forward to what we're gonna see in the next you know, 30, 40 years, whatever, and just try to imagine what it's going to be like for those kids. And it seems to me, it's what I'm hearing is that it's probably going to be a, a story that's much more like the Dust Bowl story than from what it was like, you know, when when we grew up. And and that's that's people understand that a little differently than than lines on a graph. I think it's it is that a truth that's that's accurate enough. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. I deviate uh, in the sense that uh, I have colleagues that, that take this approach that they, they figure, well, when they give a presentation about climate change, they don't want to be too alarmist, you know, and my philosophy is we need to tell people the truth. We need to tell people where we're headed. You know? and, if we don't do that, we're doing a disservice, not only to the science, but we're doing a disservice, you know. I mean, I think what is not being done by our elected officials right now is criminal, because they're just totally ignoring this issue, most of them. Mm -hmm. At least in this presidential campaign, we're getting a lot of discussion about climate change and what we need to do about it as a society, but that's only going to change with an election. So. One last question One last from week. our AV guy. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. I control control the sound so I get to ask that one. <laughs> <laughs> so we've talked lots of great big picture things, drilled down to where we are today as an individual, okay, vote, but in my day-to-day -day life, what's the most impact I can have that others can have? Electric car, hybrid car, LED bulbs are great, obviously, I'm assuming, you know, if, although then you have the production of those things and what's involved in those, the life cycle aspect of producing those specialty 
mining those specialty minerals to produce those special batteries. So, but what can I do as an individual that maybe others can also in this room do that's going to, and besides talk to our politicians and push it that way? Thanks. <laughs> All, all of those things are, that you mentioned are things you, you can do individually. Uh, you know, doing those things individually is not going to solve the problem. Uh, we can all, if we all did those things, it would certainly make a difference. But I just think we need to, we need to talk to our neighbors yes. in addition yes. to elected officials. And we need to talk to them about the seriousness, seriousness of this problem. And if, if they just don't understand it or just reject it, I mean, there are some publications out there that are very short, I mean, a few pages, that give you the basics of climate change. And people can understand these things. And uh, you know, the National Academy of Sciences, for example, has produced a document that's a question and answer kind of thing, where it answers a lot of the questions that people have about greenhouse gases and all this stuff. And it's for anybody that can read this. And uh, we can point them to things like that if they're willing to read. But again, if they're in the camp that they don't want to be confused with facts, then we just kind of give up on them and concentrate on others. So I think yeah. we could go to 14 words. Yeah. <laughs> Use less. Use less. Well, what yeah. about going to utilities and trying to get them off of their goals that were really made about you know four to five years ago that could be changed and really speeded up? Yeah. You know, it's time for us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's time for us to bid adieu, and I want to thank Don and Clint and all of you.